Thank you both. Uh, Steve Alquist, co-owner of Uprise. Thank you. Um, I want to preface. Steve, before I begin, uh, yeah. please testify on all the bills you signed up for under Morales and Mott Potter. Thank you. Yeah, I uh, want to mostly speak in favor of the minimum wage in general, raising it, and there's a couple of bills to do that, and I'm like pretty much all of them, because as I was going to preface my comments, on January 1st of this year, when the minimum wage went up 75 cents, the minimum wage workers in Rhode Island, because of inflation, were making less than they were in 2022. January 1st, their purchasing power went down. And I think we need to think about, we raised it 75 cents and they are still lost ground. Workers were worse off. It's not going up fast enough and it's not going up in any way that's competitive with our neighbors. And I think that's important to consider. I wanna talk about the preemption bill. I think it's important to understand the context. You might remember earlier tonight when George Nee mentioned that domestic workers were exempted from minimum wage protections because of what he called racism. And that was a long time ago. But less than 10 years ago, the first time preemption language was used to curb workers' rights in Rhode Island was in 2014, when the General Assembly passed a budget bill that contained a clause preventing cities and towns in Rhode Island from raising the minimum wage. This was done in Providence because hotel workers organized under Unite Here went door to door for months collecting the signatures required to place a $15 minimum wage ballot initiative before Providence voters. To prevent this from happening, House, Ch House Finance Chair, then Representative Ray, Ray Gallison, Raymond Gallison, you might remember, who was, went to prison for financial crimes unrelated to his service here, um, responded to the hotel workers' efforts by introducing a preemption bill that would prevent Providence from raising the minimum wage on its own. Possibly realizing that such a bill would be very uncomfortable for legislators to vote on, Gallison, under the leadership of Speaker of the House Nicholas Mattiello, incorporated his bill into the budget, making the language of a small part of a massive budget bill that made the voting for the language easier for legislators. We all know we vote for 99% of a budget or 95% of a budget. We don't vote for the whole thing because there's always parts in there we don't like. This is the way things work here. House spokesman Larry Berman told me at the time that Gallison's proposal was a response to hotel workers who have asked the Providence City Council to set a $15 industry minimum wage. That was the initiative they were working on. Santa Brito, a hotel worker and young mother, said to me at the time that house leadership is moving to jail us in poverty we are hardworking mothers in the backbone of the Providence tourism industry, fighting to send our kids from Head Start to Harvard. I don't, I've lost touch with her, I don't know what happened. Despite a hotel worker hunger strike outside the State House that included Shelby Maldonado, who later became, was elected to the Rhode Island House as a representative from Central Falls, then Governor Chafee signed a budget and a minimum wage preemption into law. Rhode Island was the only Democrat-controlled state legislator, legislature in the country to pass such labor prevention, preemption language at that time. Could have happened since. Um, I wanna make some comments about some of the stuff that was said earlier tonight. And um, I'm gonna approach this carefully, but I also need to say this. Um, we heard from a representative from the National Federation of Independent Businesses, NFIB. That's a lobbying group that purports to represent small businesses, emphasizing the claim that they are, quote, not a voice for big business. However, the group has been shown to lobby on issues that favor large corporate interests and runs counter to the interests of small businesses, and the group has taken millions from GOP operations linked to Carl Rove and the billionaire industrialist David and Charles Koch. News reports have also found the NFIB which tells the IRS that it is a nonpartisan service organization, engages in partisan politics, and receives millions in hidden contributions. No one's ever seen their books. I want to talk about the Employment Policies Institute, which calls itself EPI. It's one of several front groups created by Berman and Company, a Washington, D.C. public affairs firm owned by Rick Berman. Berman has earned a nickname Dr. Evil, the conservative weapon of mass destruction, and the AstroTurf Kingpin for his reputed use of the strategy of forming dozens of nonprofit front groups, attack dog websites, and alleged think, think tanks. Um, he's worked for the tobacco industry, for instance, to promote smoking. EPI also owns the internet domains minimumwage.com 
in livingwage.com. You can look at them right up. A website that attempts to portray the idea of a living wage for workers as some sort of insidious conspiracy. Um, they were launched in 1991, and they were deliberately attempted to create confusion in the eyes of the of journalists and the general public by adopting a name which closely resembles the Economic Policy Institute, which is a liberal economic think tank. Think tank. And they even used a style for their logo that was similar. I'm just saying this because what we're seeing here and what we're hearing from these economic experts is fake um, right-wing propaganda posing as economic information and it's heavily, people are heavily relying on this. So I wanna set that context. I'm pretty much done, but I wanna to touch on a few other things, um, if you don't mind, if I have the time. Thank Steven, you. Steven, I haven't stopped anyone from talking yet tonight. Okay, thank You're you. You're not gonna be the first. That's fine, I appreciate that. Um, we're, here, we're here for the duration. Okay. Um, in a restaurant, and I have experience in restaurants, and I have a brother who's a restaurant manager. Um, I worked in restaurants most of my life as a young person going to school. Um, if you have a bad day and you don't make your tip the minimum, you don't make the minimum wage, right? Let's say it's a big snow day. You don't get necessarily made up for that day. You get made up for the week. And the way it works is it's an average. On a high of a really bad Monday and a really good Friday, or even an average Good Friday, that's all lumped together and my minimum, my, I'm brought up to minimum wage only if that average falls below. But that Monday, I just worked eight hours for three dollars in the, or at the time it was even less, two something an hour. Um, and that's all I'm getting paid because on that Friday when I made, let's say 15 and made up for that, that's averaged together and that's how that money is. So when you work a bad day, you really get work a bad day. Very, I mean, just want to put that into context. It's not like they do it by day or even by hour. They do it by average. Um, I also heard tonight some comments, and I just want to say, um, what does potentially unlimited earning potential mean? I heard that from the representative from the EPI, the, the fake EPI. I mean, potentially un unlimited earning potential is zero to infinity, right? I mean, unlimited. What does that even mean? And you say a tipped worker can go in and make unlimited amounts of money. I just don't think that's even makes sense. Um, I also heard um, Representative Breen talk about how the restaurant owners are the most important people to hear from because they have, and I understand they are important to hear from, but I don't know that they have any motivation to pay their employees more. They have every motivation to pay their employees less and make more profits. So to say they're the most important, I think, leaves out the entirety of their staff, all the people who do the work in their restaurants. And I'll tell you this, I love Antonio's Pizza, so I don't want to put them down, but there is um, every reason to think that they might be speaking in their own self-interest. Correct? Um, I also heard that hourly employees who are not tipped workers might be less motivated than people who are tipped because the tips would motivate them to work harder. I've worked in restaurants and retail and I always did my best and I think most people do their best whether they're motivated or not. And if you find a place that is not paying properly or treating their employees badly, if you go to a restaurant or a place and you see a person on your phone ignoring you, more than likely it's the manager's fault, not the employee because they're reacting to a bad work site. And I think to say that they need to be motivated to be kept hungry, to be motivated to work harder, I think that really puts people down. And I think that's uh, definitely not a decent way to be. Um, I also heard that now is not the time, from Bob Bacon, right? That now is now the time to increase costs on restaurant businesses. But in the 13 years or so that I've been coming to this house, I have never heard anyone from the restaurant say, now is the time to raise the minimum wage. It is always not the time. Again, it is a little bit self-serving, but it is always the time, not the time to raise. And if I ever hear a restaurant owner say, this is the time, you know, if I ever hear the restaurant lobby come out and say, this is the time to raise the minimum wage, I'll probably just fall out of my chair because it's never going to happen. And we know that. Again, speaking to the idea that people speak in their own interest, when we hear just from restaurant owners, we're hearing people who are speaking not only in your own interest. And I just want to say one last thing, and I'll be done, I promise. If you're not paying a living wage to your employees, you are exploiting people. 
That's the definition of exploiting people, is to, is to use them and to not pay them enough so that they can survive. That is what exploitation is, and anything less than that is exploitation, and anybody asking for any less than that is asking for people to be ex exploited. That is my testimony. Thank you. Any questions of the witness? 